Luke chapter 2, and we're going to go verses 21 to 52. When the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Just as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple complex. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law. Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God and said, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed. And a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also a prophetess, Anna, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was well along in years, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and was a widow for 84 years. She did not leave the temple complex, serving God night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began to thank God and to speak about him to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom and God's grace was on him. Every year, his parents travelled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the travelling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days... They found him in the temple complex, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and with people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can read it. I thank you that Luke gives us an insight into the days after the first Christmas. On this day after Christmas, help us to think about the days ahead. Please encourage us, exhort us to wholehearted daily devotion, enjoy obedience and dependence upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, there's an insert there and there's uh, a bit of a blank space. There's a sermon outline. And uh, let me tell you that what you get on the outline is pretty much what I've got written here. So we're just going to meander our way through Luke's account and see how we go, making some observations. Uh, Kids, I'm really sorry. Uh, We ran out of creative juices, uh, so there's no kids talk today. Uh, But if you'd like to grab one of the kids sheets from last week or one of the Christmas books from yesterday, please feel free to work on that. Uh, If you actually want to do something during the sermon, you can keep track of how many times I say wholehearted. 
if you want to listen and just put a mark down and work out how many times, and then you can tell me afterwards how repetitive I was during the sermon. Uh, today's Boxing Day. Uh, today is Boxing Day. Uh, someone was talking to me earlier on this week about why it's called Boxing Day. So I did a lot of research at that place Ben told us to go to on Carol's on the Lawn on Google, and uh, I, I found out that Boxing Day emerged in England. Uh, Boxing Day was the day when the wealthy gave Christmas boxes to all the people who'd worked on Christmas Day. The chimney sweeps, the road sweepers, all those who'd kept society going got a present the next day from the wealthy. I also found out that in the church calendar, it's St Stephen's Day, the day we remember the first martyr, the man who was stoned in 36 AD for standing up for Jesus. That's not really what Australians remember Boxing Day for, do we? Uh, Today is the day to recover, isn't it? Uh, Today is the day to relax. Today is the day to digest. Today is the day to start re-gifting those presents we really didn't want to get. Today is the day for cricket and sailing on the television, isn't it? Today is Boxing Day. It's the day after Christmas. But I was asked this week, what does the Bible say about the days after Christmas? And I thought, well, you don't really get much of an opportunity to preach on that on the day after Christmas, do you? And it comes around every few years, this kind of Boxing Day. And so I went to Luke's account to spend a bit of time in Jesus' days after the first Christmas. Uh, Luke was a Greek doctor. Uh, We've heard about him over the last few weeks, especially at Carol's on the Lawn. His job was to gather facts, analyse the illness and deal with reality. And so that's how he writes his book. If you look at Luke chapter 1 verses 1 to 4, he's got a mate called Theo who's got doubts about Jesus. Luke decides to investigate, put together a book to reassure Theo that what he's heard about Jesus is true and trustworthy. And at this point we get the most comprehensive account of Jesus' childhood in any of the Gospels, don't we? The most comprehensive account of Jesus' childhood in any of the Gospels. And what we get here is very simple. It's a picture of wholehearted devotion in daily life. It's a picture of wholehearted devotion in daily life. By wholehearted, I mean all of life. By wholehearted, I mean committed By wholehearted, I mean all of your heart. By wholehearted, I mean consistent. And when you look up there on the outline at point two, you'll see that the passage we read breaks out very neatly into four parts and they mirror each other. Verses 21 to 38, you have a trip to Jerusalem. That's mirrored down in verses 41 to 50, isn't it? Uh, Verses 39 to 40 and verses 51 to 52 take you into the household home of Jesus. Kind of like little snapshots in between the trips to Jerusalem. And the picture you get right throughout of it is wholehearted devotion in daily life. Uh, Mary and Joseph in verses 21 to 38 and Simeon and Anna show wholehearted devotion as they gather in Jerusalem. Uh, There was a certain expectation and command from God to his people about making sure that you're acceptable to God, making sure that you recognised his salvation and mercy and blessing to you and displaying that in public. Uh, They weren't just obedient in that. Uh, Look with me in verse 21. Do you see there that not only were they obedient to God's law, they were obedient to the messengers of God. They actually named him the name they should have. That's only a simple fact, isn't it? But you notice that it's emphasised? They did what the angel told them to. They're obedient. And after they'd fulfilled some of the requirements that God had given them in verse 22 to be ready to come into his presence, what do they do? They go up to Jerusalem to present the boy to God. God had expected his people to do this because he'd taken all the firstborns, hadn't he, when he'd saved them out of Egypt. And so every firstborn son had to be dedicated to God and bought back from him at a price, showing God's mercy, God's provision. And so they do that. 
And do you notice again that they take the boy with them? You didn't have to do that. You could leave the boy at home with his nanny, go up, pay the price and come home. No, no, they're wholehearted. They all go to the temple. And they go there in order to give thanks to God for his blessing to them. They're obedient. When they get there, they meet two other people, don't they? Simeon and Anna. Uh, They're both elderly from what we can work out. Uh, They're both people who've been waiting for a long time. Both of them have been waiting for God's promise to deal with the brokenness of the world. A Simeon's waiting for consolation through God's people. Anna talks about there in verse 38, redemption of God's people. Both of them are waiting for God to step into the world and do what he promised, to deal with human rebellion and brokenness. And when this boy turns up in his parents' arms, they both recognise him for what he is. By God's mercy, they see the salvation of the world. And they break into song and praise. They break into words that point people to God and his faithfulness. So this first snapshot in verses 21 to 38 of the days after Christmas, wholehearted devotion. That wholehearted devotion is expressed in obedience. Obedience to what God has said. It's expressed in dependence. Dependence upon the one who always does what he promises and it's shown in joy. You can't miss the joy in this passage, can you? Can you imagine being there in the temple and seeing Simeon grab this little one and Anna talk about this little one? It's almost like the first scene from The Lion King where that baby's held up. Look, everyone, the joy of the world, the salvation of humanity, the consolation and redemption of broken people. Pay attention. And then they go home. Down there in verse 39. Now notice that they don't go home without doing everything they were required. Uh, They weren't corner cutters, were they? Uh, They weren't stingy in their obedience when they had completed everything according to the law of the Lord. They're wholeheartedly obedient. And then they head home down the road to Nazareth. And you get a really brief snapshot of Jesus' life there, don't you, in verse 40. The boy grew up and became strong filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. We could make all sorts of wild guesses about their home life, couldn't we? There's plenty of false gospels out there about what Jesus was like as he was growing up. Did he always take the garbage out when he was asked? Did he always unstack the dishwasher when he was asked? Did he get into playground fights? Did he talk back to his teachers? We're not told any of that, are we? Do you notice what we are told? He grew up, he became strong, filled with wisdom, God's grace, God's grace was on him. And Jesus grew up. Isn't that what we heard on Christmas Eve? He didn't stay in the cradle. He grew up. He was a human and he was filled with wisdom and God's grace was on him. Whatever other picture you want to have of the family life of Joseph, Mary and Jesus, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And when we get to the next section, verses 41 to 50, we see that this family was wholeheartedly devoted. Every year his parents travelled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. It wasn't a short trip. It wasn't an easy trip. But every year. And can you imagine of all the humans in the world, which human being could skip Passover? <laughs> Jesus of all people could skip Passover. I mean, he, he was there, wasn't he? But his family never missed it. The yearly reminder of the mercy of God, where at great cost and expense, at the spilling of blood of the firstborn, at the sacrifice of an unblemished creature, God saves his people. And his family never missed the opportunity to go to Jerusalem and to celebrate it. Uh, This is a particular moment because he's on the cusp of manhood, of being recognised as a man amongst the people of God, 12 years old. They went up according to the custom of the festival. And when the boy gets there, what does he do? He hangs out at his dad's place. He's in his father's house. 
And he spends time there displaying the fruits of the wisdom and the grace and the growth that's been upon him. He sits there with the religious leaders and talks to them and they're amazed. His parents show the understandable concern of his earthly life. Son, what are you doing? And he reminds them of the mercy of God. I'm actually here in my father's house. Do you remember who I am? Do you remember what was said about me? Do you remember what Simeon and Anna were looking forward to, the consolation and the redemption promised by God? And then he goes home again, doesn't he? We get that next snapshot, verse 51 to 52. As he goes home, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them, in case you thought that he wasn't obedient. His mother kept all these things in her heart. And notice this about Jesus, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and with people. Have you ever thought that about Jesus, that he grew in wisdom? And not did he just grow physically, he grew in wisdom. Jesus learnt more and more what it was to navigate a broken world as God's son. And a a statement of the mercy of God. Now, wherever you go in this snapshot of the days after Christmas, you meet these three expressions. You meet obedience, don't you? It's everywhere there, isn't it? (laughs) It's even emphasised there at the end in verse 51. Jesus was obedient. Mary and Joseph were obedient to the commands of God. Simeon and Anna were obedient to the promises of God. Mary and Joseph were obedient to the festivals and the remembrance of God. Jesus was obedient to his own mother and father. In all of them, there's an expression of dependence, isn't there? They were dependent as they went up to Jerusalem, expressing their reliance on God in naming him Jesus, in offering him sacrifices. Simeon and Anna expressed their dependence every day by going to the temple. Jesus was dependent, going into his own home and relying upon his mother and father. And he expresses his dependence on his father by staying in his house. And in all of those snapshots, there's joy, isn't there? There's joy. Naming our boy in line with the angel, the Lord saves. Simeon and Anna, the joy of finally confronting the one who'll deal with the brokenness they feel in their bones. Going up every year to Jerusalem to remember that great salvation event as God took his people from slavery to freedom into their own land. And Jesus himself, God's grace was on him and he grew in favour. Wholehearted devotion in daily life, obedience, dependence and joy. The days after Christmas. It's very different to how we spend Boxing Day, isn't it? I'm I'm not casting any aspersions or shadows on Boxing Day. We need to relax. (laughs) Cricket is good to watch. It's great to watch the sailing. But maybe we need to rethink how we do Boxing Day in and of ourselves so we think about wholehearted devotion in daily life. Just as we remember the birth of Jesus... Wouldn't it be great to treat Boxing Day every year as the day after Christmas? Thinking about what has been and preparing for what is going to come. We we got a snapshot of that out of Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. I'm at point 3 if you're taking notes. That's a terrific little verse, isn't it? Or two verses. Uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 to 2 perhaps. My favourite verses in the Bible. But did you listen to them very carefully? They're the application of the previous 11 chapters, aren't they? Therefore. And those previous 11 chapters are all about the mercies of God. Did you notice how that was through that account in Luke, the mercies of God? The boy, the angel, the name, the sacrifice given back to God to symbolically reclaim your firstborn, Simeon and Anna, the provision of a home where Jesus could grow in stature and wisdom and have God's grace upon him, the movement every year to Jerusalem to remember the great mercy of God that was expressed in the Exodus. In view of those mercies, what what do you do? Well, you do two things. You offer 
and you be transformed. You offer what? Do you remember what it said in Romans chapter 12? I, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. Logical. Bodies, all of your existence, wholehearted. In view of what God has expressed, the days after Christmas are about offering your existence to God. In view of what he's already done. Not to earn it, not to gain it, but in view. And when that happens, it speaks to the world that God deserves what? Well, God deserves everything that bears his image. That's us, isn't it? He came and took on flesh so we could give back to him what he deserved. Acknowledge him for how significant he is in every part of existence. And that will involve transformation, won't it? A lack of conformity, a complete renewal, a redirection of mind and heart and so a radical display that God gets all of me. Wholehearted devotion in daily life. And so what might that look like in the next few days? I'm at the last point on the outline. Well, let me just say three very brief things. Get to know the engine, the driving force of wholehearted devotion. It's not your own effort, is it? It's not your own self-control. It's not even your own goodness. It's God's mercy, isn't it? Did you notice that? Woven right throughout it? through those early snapshots of Jesus' days after the first Christmas, right through to the book of Romans, chapter 12, by in view of what God has given you out of his love. For those who already know that, please let me encourage you in the days after Christmas, keep getting familiar with that in all of its aspects. Not just Jesus died on the cross for me, but that means Jesus is Lord of all. Not just Jesus is the judge of the earth, but Jesus is meek and humble. Not just Jesus is the ruler with the iron rod, but Jesus is the gentle shepherd. All of God's mercy from every angle and facet. If you haven't heard of that, is there any better thing to know the day after Christmas than the mercy of God? Secondly, Consider what it means to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, a logical act of giving back to God what he deserves. What might that look like? How might that be a display in our town, family and community that God is the one we're wholehearted about? How might a lack of that display what alternative we're wholehearted about? And thirdly, please be renewed in your minds. Please be renewed in your minds. How might that be possible? Well, you're actually holding the thing that will do it, aren't you? In a physical sense, applied by God. In a spiritual sense. What better way to get ready for the new year than to finish the old year by reading God's word? Don't let a Bible reading program start on January 1st. Why not start it on December 26th or any other day of the year as we expose ourselves to what God has spoken and the revelation of his nature and his mercy. The days after Christmas, well, you could re-gift and find those who are poor. You could remember someone who was wholeheartedly devoted, St Stephen, who gave his life for Jesus. Or you could sit down every year and read Luke 2, 21 to 52 and Romans 12, 1 to 2 and finish the year thinking about wholehearted devotion to the one who came in God's mercy. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for this little cook's tour of uh, Jesus' days after his birth. I thank you for the snapshot of his life up to the cusp of his manhood. Father, thank you for the reminder of wholehearted devotion in the life of Mary and Joseph and Jesus, in the life of Simeon and Anna, in in the life of your people. 
Uh, Father, thank you for the reminder in Romans 12 of the very same truth. Father, thank you for your mercy, the mercy that came in the flesh to live, die and rise for our sins, the mercy that gives us new life, the mercy that transforms our life. Father, please work in us wholehearted devotion in daily living, a devotion that is committed, dependent and abundantly joyous. In Jesus' name, amen.